What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So with Metroid Prime Remastered, we did get a physical copy weeks after it just shadow dropped during that direct. And now we're starting to see some sales information come in that really shows the upward trajectory of the entire Metroid franchise. And we'll go over that here today. Also, we are going to be talking about a situation that's unfolded in Australia when it comes to loot boxes and gambling. And we'll also be talking about a couple of bugs that have now hit Nintendo, one for the Wii U and the other for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with Hogwarts Legacy, specifically though on the last gen consoles, not the current gen PlayStation 4, and Xbox Series. Of course, the PS4 and Xbox One versions were slated to come out in April, so next month. And then we have July to look forward to for the Switch version that will be very interesting to see. <laughs> That's what I'll say about that. But it appears they need a bit more time for that PS4 and Xbox One version. They shared this over on Twitter with the new release date saying the team is working hard to deliver the best possible experience on all platforms. We need more time to do this. Hogwarts Legacy will launch for PS4 and Xbox One May 5th, 2023. So that's about, yeah, a one month delay essentially here. And then as I mentioned, two months or so later, we should see it on the Switch. So this game will have multiple releases, obviously, with it already doing really well on the PS5, the Xbox Series, and PC. And that's one of the big reasons, I think, by the end of this year, it'll probably end up being either the top selling game or right up there in the top three. But I guess we'll find out later on this year. Also, we did have a pretty big new game announcements for fans of City Skylines, as it appears. A sequel will be releasing later this year. There was an entire trailer that was shown off yesterday. You can see some of that here. They say, if you can dream it, you can build it. The highly acclaimed hit City Skylines is now revolutionizing the city builder genre again. The sequel to one of the best selling management games of its decade is coming in 2023. Get ready for a new epic scale in the most realistic city builder ever. And people have been going back and forth exactly what Paradox Interactive here is going to do with the follow-up to City Skylines. I mean, I, I played around with City Skylines somewhat. I didn't get like super into it, but I, I mean, yeah, it is a really good kind of like Sim City type game. And I I'm kind of curious what they'll come up with here. It is coming to the PS5, Xbox Series, PC, of course, and then also launching directly into Game Pass. So that's, I think, a pretty good pickup overall for that service. We'll just have to wait for an exact release date. At this time, we just know coming out sometime later on this year. Oh, and we talked about Mario Day last week when it was unveiled that Nintendo would have a questionable Switch bundle, as well as sales on a bunch of Mario games. And it appears that they're on sale early, especially at different retailers, which just to kind of refresh your memory here are the different titles that'll be on sale with Mario Odyssey, uh, New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, Mario Kart Deluxe 8, Super Mario 3D World, Bowser's Fury, Mario Maker 2, Mario Party Superstars, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, and Yoshi's Crafted World. These are currently on sale physically, by the way, at different retailers right now. Look for Amazon, Target, GameStop, and Walmart, all honoring this for physical copies, as well as digital codes. So technically, you can buy it right on the website now and just get a code sent to you and redeem it directly on your Switch. Just a heads up, if you were hoping to pick one of these up at the $40 price point, it is available now. You don't have to wait till Friday. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way. Let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with the UK sales charts as well as a look back at the month of February showing a massive increase for the PlayStation 5 and a smaller number seemingly for the Xbox had some people scratching their head. But let's head over here to gamesindustry.biz again covering this past February compared to last year's where they say February console sales are up 65% over the same month last year up over 15 or 14% for January PS5 sales up 316% over the same period the year before up 27% over January which a lot of that is from the increased stock because last year I mean think about last year or around this time there was impossible to find a PS5. They were still going for a ton of money on places like eBay and just other secondhand markets. Now it's much easier to find a PlayStation 5. I'm actually seeing them more and more regularly at places like a Best Buy or a Walmart, just kind of there ready to be purchased. So uh, it just took a couple of years into the generation to 
to get there. The Xbox Series S and X, however, they it did see a, a sales increase 21% in February compared with January, and they're up 15% over February last year. But year to date, the platform sales are down slightly by 5.3%. I do wonder if this is just the fact that they haven't had any like big first party title release. And that's something we've talked about with Xbox where it's, I mean, they had Hi-Fi Rush, but that was a fun shadow drop. But like the Starfield, that being a big one, you know, a, a, the big Starfield title to put out there and, and just be this massive release for them. The, the, the Red Falls of their library, different things that kind of sets them apart from really the third party market that both consoles share. And that's the thing I'm gonna look towards is when something like Starfield or Redfall drop or even Forza Motorsport, what kind of effect that has on sales? Because I feel like, yes, it would push them in the correct positive direction. Whereas now they've been kind of coasting a bit. Yes, adding stuff to Game Pass with from third parties, but from their own first party studios, just getting things prepared. And again, I've mentioned this before, I think 2023 is when things are finally gonna start getting rolling there. As for last week, let's head over here to the sales charts with the top 10, starting with Hogwarts Legacy, which is just kind of hung out up there, top of the charts, basically since it released for the most part. And we have Metroid Prime Remastered. Despite the stock issues for this game, it is number two on the charts. And, and this is this is pretty big overall for, I would say Metroid Prime Remastered in general, because consider the fact that the physical copy came out after it was shadow dropped digitally. And I, I can tell you now, FOMO, I'm sure, set in for a lot of people with it just being available rather than waiting for the physical copy. So I can absolutely believe that this is heavily skewed to the digital side of things when it comes to sales. But it is currently the second biggest physical release of the year so far, and that's ahead of Dead Space Remake and Fire Emblem Engage. So once again, Metroid is definitely trending in the, the right direction here, just up as we head towards Metroid Prime 4. So hey, exciting stuff there for Metroid fans and the Metroid franchise. At number three, we have FIFA 23, then God of War Ragnarok, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Wolong Fallen Dynasty, Kind of a shame to see it at, at number eight. It is, at least I think, a, a good game. I'm, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Minecraft Switch Edition and then Grand Theft Auto 5 because, of, of course. Anyway, looking at Metroid Prime Remastered, I wouldn't be shocked if it kind of hung out in the top five, at least over the next week of reports because there were talks that it was getting harder and harder to find in stock and that Nintendo would continue stocking this game going forward as much as they could. So it's very possible that with new stock comes more and more sales for it and it just kind of hangs out in, in that top five area for a little while now as people are finally getting their hands on copies of the game. But exciting stuff here for Metroid, especially Metroid Prime 4, since well, we assume anyway, the fourth one may be coming up by the end of this year. I'm crossing my fingers for that one. Next up, let's talk about an interesting situation that's taking place in Australia and while this does involve FIFA and loot boxes, which, I mean, come on, EA and loot boxes, this is a whole thing that's been going on since last generation, and it's continued on into the PS5 and Xbox series generation of systems, but this situation is actually between FIFA players and Sony, and you might be wondering, why exactly is that? Well, we can see this posted up once again over on gamesindustry.biz with Australian court rules that FIFA loot boxes violate gambling laws. Yeah, so this is a big deal in general when it comes to loot boxes, as EA is gonna be looking at that a, a bit harder, and I'm sure other parts of the world and, and uh, regulatory bodies kind of noticing this ruling as well, if loot boxes are considered gambling, I, what they'd be 18 plus at that point, and I don't think you want that on any of your different FIFA titles, and consider the fact that EA makes a lot of money from FIFA Ultimate Team specifically because of the loot box or the card packs or, or what have you there, but, we can see it says the verdict was the result of a 2022 lawsuit between a group of PlayStation-owned FIFA players and Sony Interactive Entertainment. The reason the lawsuits were filed against Sony rather than FIFA developer and publisher Electronic Arts is because the loot boxes were purchased through the PlayStation Store, so the users purchasing contracts are with Sony. And at this point, they're looking for full refunds, and I guess Sony could appeal the decision, but it's interesting that it's EA who would have technically caused the entire situation to transpire, but it's Sony who has to go defend the whole thing 
in court. And I have a feeling Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo wouldn't exactly be thrilled having to deal with that when it's EA who's presenting the matter, but I guess going through their store, you gotta go to the three platform holders to talk money and, and all of this. So uh, interesting stuff. Again, curious how this continues to spill over to other parts and regions of the world when it comes to loot boxes. Something tells me based on EA's recent behavior and them being a bit more careful around loot boxes, maybe they're gonna figure out a way to kind of get around this and continue making a ton of money from FIFA Ultimate Team because I feel like that is certainly a part of their business that is essentially funding everything else around them with how much money they make off of these microtransactions. So I am curious to see what happens with their FIFA franchise in the future when it comes to the microtransactions and loot boxes. Next up, let's talk about some rather scary headlines, I guess, uh, when it comes to save files or even a console's ability to function in the first place. A couple of these headlines were sent over to me, and we'll start with this one, that being the Wii U. And for example, we can see this from Nintendo Everything, where they say the Wii U may break for some system owners if not used. Reports claim. So there's this concern going around right now, and it seemed to be brought up, I believe, on NeoGAF. It was a forum thread that was created when someone realized, hey, I haven't used my Wii U in a while. Took it out of the closet, and uh, all of a sudden I have an error code, 160-0103. It's appearing on screen, and I can't do anything. Like, the system just won't work anymore. And some others have come into that thread and said, yeah, I've run into the same problem. And this is kind of funny because I've seen this happen before, and I had to go back and really think about this. I, For one, I've seen bricked we use in my time working on different systems, and I do remember this as far back as maybe a year or two after the system came out. So I did some searching, and yeah, there are Reddit posts of people running into the same error code from 2015 even, or even 2014. This one, for example, says they found the solution for error 160-0103, but it's specifically for Super Smash Bros. for the Wii U, and I'll, I'll leave this link down below in the sources just in case someone is running into this problem. But the long and the short of it is, the error code that is being pointed to here has to do with the system NAND flash memory or just the ability to understand how to function in the first place. And you can have corrupted blocks kind of happen when it's trying to read and write different things like save data. Turning off, like for example, when you are updating your firmware, you know how it says, don't turn off your system? Well, that's because you can actually damage the NAND flash completely when it's trying to write firmware or in other times, corrupt parts of it with save data being written or erased or any of these different things. And right now people are taking it out of storage, I guess, for whatever reason, and they're now realizing that this has become a problem. And it's also possible that just the NAND flash could actually have some general faults I mean, it is technically a degradable chip over time, and yeah, you could see the Wii U's just kind of drop off the face of the earth because of this one error code that seemingly comes out of nowhere. And I think overall, maybe two or three corrupted Wii U's had come in just in general. The Wii U wasn't exactly selling a ton anyway, and when it would come in, it was because kids jammed something in the disk drive, popsicle sticks, DS games, multiple Wii games. These are all things that I remember off the top of my head. But for those cases where there were corruption issues, I remember once we were trying to fix it in store with the person and they were like, let's just format the thing, bricked it. So don't format it. That's first and foremost, or it will just completely brick it. And then after that, we just told them to send it back to Nintendo. The problem now is Nintendo does not repair Wii U's anymore. I mean, they're shutting down the store, so they don't really care about the system. And there's a limited number of Wii U consoles. So at this point, if you have the error code, I would just kind of hang out with your Wii U and believe it or not, hope that the homebrew community can come up with a fix. Because at the very least, if your system is currently modded, you can back up your NAND and kind of get around this. But if you have not, and you've run into this issue, you're kind of stuck in the dead in the water right now. So, hey, here's hoping the homebrew community can do what Nintendo couldn't. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about the other scary headline that was going around. This one sounds like a pretty serious bug as well, since it's basically the most popular game released in the last like two or three months or whatever. And that's Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And 
yeah, I know they, they released a patch, right? It didn't do anything when it comes to performance. They had apparently fixed different bugs and removed a number of Pokemon and things from the overworld, trying to get it run at least a bit smoother and not crash. But now because of Pokemon Go connectivity, there seems to be a new issue that sounds pretty serious. There's a thread on Reddit that's been collecting a lot of information and different accounts from people. And we'll take a look at the, the title for it. Save files being lost. Oh, that seems like a big deal, but they say we're now up to at least five people in the subreddit and the comments and other posts that have lost their save data after pairing with Pokemon Go to send a postcard. So essentially they have been building more and more people up. They've seen, I think 20 or 30 people now who have chimed in just in this thread alone saying, yeah, all of a sudden after this update, pairing with Pokemon Go, doing postcards or whatever else you do there, and after buying the downloadable content early, which I think they have a benefit, but otherwise I don't really know why you would buy digital goods like DLC that's still a ways off early, but hey, there you go. You got, I guess, get that benefit there, that bonus. Um, they're also running into this issue and having the backup save by holding up B and X does not seem to work at all. It's once again, seems to kind of just corrupt the save data. But as of now, the situation is still evolving so if you have had this experience where your save data was lost for scarlet or violet seemingly in the last week or two since that update 1.2.0 whatever launched and then you also have the go connectivity i would head over there and just let them know exactly what you experienced and the system you're on they're trying to collect as much information as they can just to try to make game freak and nintendo aware of this because some people in the thread are mentioning losing save files where they have 100 shiny pokemon or 500 hours of game time, and wow, that's that's rough. Especially when you realize if you pay for NSO, you have cloud backups, but not not for Pokemon. Hey, that's the home feature that's coming uh, later on at some point. Sure, it'd be nice to have that now. Oh, and I do think it's worth mentioning that this hasn't gotten to some massive level where millions of people are affected. It's still like 30 or so people, so it's not like panic mode or anything yet, but I do believe it's worth being uh, at least aware of and really know that yeah, there seems to be some weird bug that people are trying to figure out that could indeed affect your 100 plus hour save file in Pokemon. So if you're curious or you've been affected, check the link down in the sources of the thread. And before we go to the comments of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday. Where I ask, these are the highest rated console Dragon Ball Z video games on Metacritic. Which one is your favorite? I was very curious where the votes were going to fall on this. Look at this. 39% Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkai HD3. That is a, it's a legendary game. I mean, it's, it's a late release on the PlayStation 2. It was released on the Wii, but it had so many characters and variety. It was definitely a compelling title. But then look, Dragon Ball Fighters, a very recent game for Dragon Ball from Arxis, uh, 31%. And then Budokai 3, another classic, then Kakarot, and then Xenoverse 2. I almost wonder if people just kind of xenoverse out with that because there was a lot of content with it, maybe too much with all the downloadable content, but there it is. Tenkai Ichi 3 certainly shows you why there's so much excitement for Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkai Ichi 4. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Alex saying, buzzing to see a new Budokai game announced, but then I'm reminded of how many fighting games today will sell you a huge chunk of the roster separately. Some of the most fun moments from games like Budokai 3 were unlocking more of the characters. I hope the next one can use the same approach because I know that when I boot up a standard edition of the next game, it would be a bit of a downer to see a bunch of iconic characters I played as a kid being locked behind paywall. So I would hope they look at Tenkaichi 3, realize one of the biggest reasons people liked it so much because there were so many characters to play as and unlock. I do kind of miss the days where you'd get 10 characters, 20 characters, then you just unlock a ton. That was great. Now, yes, you're basically buying character packs and all this, but here's the thing with Tenkaichi 4, they should have a chance to just add characters if the anime would get back on track and start following the manga again, as there are plenty of characters and forms already kind of out there. I could see them doing something like Orange Piccolo and Beast Gohan just being added through way of a character pack and just say, oh, we were already in development when that was all going on. But either way, as long as they show up to the table with a ton of characters, I think we should be okay. I would like to see them try to beat what was there with Tenkaichi 3, considering that we assume it's going to be a sequel at Tenkaichi 4, but 
I guess we'll find out. Their recent trend isn't exactly telling us that they're going to have an overwhelming amount of characters day one, but we can always hope. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here. Today was Metroid Prime Remastered, doing really well out of the gates physically. How do you think Metroid Prime 4, though, is going to be received both critically and commercially. And then also, what about these different bugs that are being talked about right now for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet in the Wii U? Seems to come back to save data or corrupted NAND flashes. Let me know if you've experienced any of that yourself. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.